Hi, everyone that's just joining. We are about to get started with our webinar today uh, on digital fundraising during the coronavirus pandemic. So as we get started, I'd love to hear from you. There's a chat box here, and I'd love to hear more about what you're hoping to get out of today's webinar and uh, a little bit about your organization and where you're from. So feel free to chat that in as we get started. So we have a ton of uh, great content to go over today. Um, so as I dive in, um, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. My name is Candice and I'm the manager of success and education here at Causebox, um, where I've been helping nonprofits for the last five years or so um, run their digital fundraising. So um, something that we uh, do is that we help you raise more with less effort through our digital fundraising software. So uh, while a lot of software is clunky, complex, and contract bound, Cosvox actually helps you tidy up your digital fundraising. So we empower you to raise more with less effort through our donation pages, crowdfunding, and peer-to-peer -peer fundraising. So if you're interested in learning more about Cosvox, we can help you get set up with your donation form on your website. We can help you run crowdfunding campaigns, peer-to-peer -peer fundraising campaigns, and much more. So I wanna dive right into our topic today, which is digital fundraising during the coronavirus pandemic. So here's just a quick look at what we're gonna get started doing. So we're gonna take a look at fundraising in the context of the coronavirus. Um, and then we're going to talk about assessing your digital fundraising needs at your organization so that you can come up with a digital fundraising plan. And then we're going to dive into the top 10 digital fundraising best practices that you can implement um, that will help you best navigate the pandemic. So when we talk about um, the coronavirus, I think it's really important for us to just put fundraising in the context of the climate today and what's going on. So let's be honest, there's a lot of challenges that we're currently facing um, that we all have to personally navigate as well as professionally deal with as well. So um, I mean, the coronavirus is a pandemic that's a pretty extreme public health crisis that has upended lives. So um, whether you know personally someone that has been affected by the virus or you yourself have been affected by this, um, or you're just keeping up to date with all of the latest updates and the reports and the news, uh, it can be a bit overwhelming. And if we're all honest, it's a little scary um, all of this has happened really suddenly and we've had to pretty much change our lives and uh, everyone has been affected by this in one way or the other. Um, but of course, you know, healthcare workers on the front lines are doing so much and so we're so thankful for them. But whoever you are and whatever you do, your life has been affected by this. And so uh, a little bit that, <laughs> a little thing that's kind of driving some of the anxiety um, right now is the reality is that we don't know exactly how long this is going to go on. Um, of course, there's different reports. Some people say June, some people, um, you know, are hoping for the end of this month. And then some people say that this could go on into late summer, maybe the fall. So this is really hard for all of us to navigate, especially when it comes to fundraising, because you don't know what to plan for. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about um, how to plan around um, all of the questions that are still in the air about when our things are going to get back to normal. Um, another challenge that we're all facing is that we've had to really quickly change our whole usual ways of working. So probably many of you are home with kids now um, and figuring out working from home, but um, there's also probably a lot of uh, programs that you're running that have to be adapted and changed in order for you to continue um, serving those that you serve. So our usual ways of working um, have been kind of turned on their head and there's been some unique challenges that have arisen from um, trying to navigate uh, social distancing while still providing the services that you need. 
Um, so I'm going to go ahead and go on to the next slide. There we go. And then um, another challenge that we're facing is that unfortunately, fundraising events for the foreseeable future are canceled. So if you're like many of the organizations that we work with, you had your beautifully laid out fundraising events planned for the next uh, six months or so. And now you're trying to figure out um, what to do about that? How do you move forward? Um, can you still plan on events in the fall? Um, there's a lot of questions right now about what you can do. Um, and a lot of people feel like their fundraising has kind of been cut off at the legs, unfortunately, because maybe you're more event driven. And so you have your galas and your breakfast and um, all of those kind of in person fundraising events that you rely on for really meeting your essential fundraising goals. So um, now you're tasked with trying to figure out how to meet those goals um, while not having those fundraising events in place. Um, and unfortunately, something that is um, probably going to affect your nonprofit in one way or, or the other, and maybe already has, is that it is a, a time where many people are out of work and they don't have the income um, that they were expecting. Um, and unfortunately, we're likely headed into a recession. Um, so all of this is, it, it is scary. If we're going to be honest, it's scary. But there is a way forward and a way for you to still navigate these challenges and continue fundraising for your organization. And really what that looks like <clears throat> is that, um, or as we're chatting with a lot of organizations, so we've been doing these digital fundraising consultations. So I've probably talked with, I don't know, probably like 80 organizations over the last couple of weeks um, about how they're trying to figure out digital fundraising. And so some of the common questions that I keep getting um, or common myths that people believe is that number one is that you shouldn't fundraise right now. So um, some organizations are not providing direct release, relief services and it feels a little weird to ask for funds at the moment um, when you, know, uh, you may think that there are organizations that probably need the donations more. Um, but there is, uh, the reality is, is that your organization's mission is still really, really important and whatever it is that you do and whoever it is that you serve, those people and those, um, those things that you do still really matter. And I think that's something that, um, you can focus in on is, is what really ignited your passion for your mission to begin with and kind of focusing on that, that, the importance of your mission as you plan your fundraising. The second thing I've heard a lot is that a lot of organizations feel like you can't fundraise now. Um, so with some of those fundraising events canceled, a lot of people, um, you know, really feel like there's not really a way forward where maybe that event feels irreplaceable um, or you don't have the technology or the know-how um, to really master digital fundraising. And so um, really that's what we're here for as well is to help you adapt your digital fundraising strategy. And so um, I think the best way to move forward is to maybe get out of the events box and explore digital fundraising more in depth. Um, and I think it takes a little bit of creativity. So the nonprofits that will withstand the coronavirus pandemic, the best are the ones that are the quickest to adopt a comprehensive, a comprehensive digital fundraising strategy. So this is really super essential for your organization now more than ever is to switch pretty much all of your fundraising over to digital. Um, and uh, there's some best practices that we'll get into later that will help you really do this well. Um, and we're always here to help as well as you transition to digital fundraising. So as you think about digital fundraising, the first step is to really assess your digital fundraising needs. A lot of things have changed at your organization and it's time to take a step back and take a look at what it is that you really need when it comes to fundraising at the moment. So the first thing to take a look at is your existing fundraising plans. 
So think through what existing fundraising plans have been disrupted or could be disrupted over the next, I would say, six months or so. Um, I think it's important to um, maybe make a list of all of these fundraising events, um, even the smaller fundraising plans that you have, um, even that's one-on-one -on -one lunches, for example, um, and kind of put all of those things in one list to consider the amount that you won't be bringing in due to um, disruptions in in-person activities. Um, this can help you find, figure out what you actually need to ask for when it comes to running a digital fundraising campaign. And something else to think about is to factor in any sunk costs. So is there an event space that maybe you already paid for that you can't get a refund for, or is there, um, you know, those uh, paper flyers that unfortunately aren't going to be handed out um, at the event and considering what costs that you've already incurred that maybe you still owe um, or can't get refunded. Um, so that's always a good thing to keep in mind when it comes to um, figuring out what your fundraising needs actually are. Um, and another thing is to consider what can be moved to a virtual fundraising event. So a lot of events can be transferred online. Maybe it won't look the exact same, um, like maybe your uh, gala presentation um, will look a little bit different online than it does um, typically, but there are ways to really quickly adapt. So um, we've put together a list of virtual fundraising ideas so this is something that you'll want to probably come back to later and think more through. But um, just to give you a few ideas, um, you know, we've seen plenty of crowdfunding, peer-to-peer -peer fundraising campaigns. Um, you know, definitely when you're considering taking an event online, you want to incorporate a live stream. Um, and uh, there's just so many ideas here and even more um, that you can take a look at and consider when it comes to moving your events online. So I just want to give you a quick example. Um, so the Nonprofit Technology Network, um, they pretty much raise all their funds through their annual conference. And unfortunately, their conference had to be canceled this year and they had a lot of sunk costs that they couldn't get back, whether it was the space rentals or um, just other things that they needed to pay for in advance for the conference. And so they recently launched this campaign to raise $100,000 to kind of cover those costs. So if you are in a position where your event got canceled and it was too late to transfer to it um, to a virtual event and maybe too late to get some funds back, you can launch a campaign like um, nonprofit, like the Nonprofit Technology network did um, just explaining to your community what uh, what you've kind of lost due to the outbreak another example is summit assistance dogs they typically do an annual luncheon and uh, unfortunately that is not happening this year but they were really quick on the uptake where they switched their event to virtual and um, they got together their whole community to even arrange virtual tables. Um, so each individual signed up for their own personal fundraising page and are having people join them at their virtual table and fundraising um, the amount that would have been raised during filling a whole table at the event. So this was just a great example of um, an organization that really quickly changed to a virtual fundraiser. Um, and is well on their way to reaching their goal of $175,000. So um, they do such great things. They're also doing a uh, YouTube um, live stream on May 7th. So they're going to be inviting everyone to join for that live stream. So when it comes to adapting your digital fundraising, I think that the, your digital fundraising is only limited by your creativity and willingness to adapt. Um, there are so many great ideas out there um, that you could really implement at your organization. It just takes a willingness to maybe think a little bit outside of the box and what you've done before. 
and try new things. Um, so in that way, it's kind of an exciting time for you to maybe try something you've never tried before. All right, so that was kind of fundraising, existing fundraising events. Um, now let's talk a little bit about your programs. Um, so your programs have probably changed, um, or if they haven't changed yet, um, there are probably changes that you need to um, accommodate at your organization, or potentially even new programs that are really needed at this time. So um, I recommend taking a look at all of your programs and kind of listing out what is changing and what the costs are involved in changing them. Um, and also considering if you do need to expand your programs or um, provide masks to you know, your community, for example, um, you know, what are the costs involved in that and incorporate that into your fundraising ask as well. Um, so here's a quick uh, example from the Homeless Children's Playtime Project. So um, they typically work one-on-one -on -one, um, and have uh, these amazing playtime sessions with children that are in shelters um, and offer toys and all that good stuff um, for these really vulnerable children. Um, but unfortunately, that those in-person uh, meetings can't happen anymore. But what they are doing is that they are putting together um, packages to uh, for the children to take home with um, toys and things to keep them entertained and so that's really essential and they're raising $25,000 to help continue serving those communities in a different way than they have previously. Um, another example is the Global Friends Foundation. They've had to really quickly ramp up production of masks to serve the vulnerable um, children in their communities as well. Um, and so they, I, what I like about their appeal is that they're pretty specific about um, what this new program entails and what the exact costs are and as well as how many masks they're going to be distributing within the networks that they're currently working in. Um, another organization that is expanding their efforts is the Hebrew Free Loan Society. So they are um, raising funds to really help um, New Yorkers uh, and, and financially assist New Yorkers throughout this time. So they typically give um, free loans to uh, New Yorkers to help them create small businesses, but now they're go going to be covering food, medical expenses, and um, still supporting those small businesses through this time. So they unfortunately, um, that well, they fortunately are stepping up and um, looking to raise a lot in order to serve the communities that they're already working with. Um, so you may find yourself in a similar position where you need to ra rapidly expand programs. And I think this is um, a great opportunity for you to launch a campaign to help do that. Um, now let's take a look at operational fundraising needs. Um, so this is kind of um, something that a lot of organizations feel like is a little less sexy <laughs> when it comes to making an ask. Uh, it's a little bit, I guess, harder to explain um, like operational needs and what um, funds are going to. But I actually think it's a really, really important time to fundraise for operational expenses. Um, and there probably is a significant need at your organization already. So maybe consider um, what current costs you're having trouble covering, um, whether it's rent, uh, paying staff, um, or unforeseen purchases needed to run your organization to effectively work from home. Um, I know an organization that's currently raising funds to just cover um, Zoom expenses and another organization that's raising funds for laptops for their employees. So um, think through what operational expenses you are incurring um, at this time and what you might need to do in order to help cover that. So um, Camp Westwind, uh, the Westwind Stewardship Group um, is raising funds to help cover operational expenses um, and make sure that they can continue fundraising or continue operating rather when the pandemic is over. Um, it's essential that your organization still exists. Uh, and so this is really super important um, work that you're doing and uh, they kind of lay out really nicely here, um, you know, what this $250,000 is helping um, cover 
when it comes to the financial gap that they're experiencing in um, for their operational expenses. Um, another thing is to consider new fundraising opportunities. So um, there's no better time than now than to try new digital fundraising strategies. Uh, maybe pull something out that you uh, had an idea about last year and didn't really feel like you had that time and opportunity to run it. Um, might Now is probably a great time to try out new strategies and see how you can engage your communities. Um, you also probably have maybe a little bit more time to invest in um, your relationships with your existing donors. Um, so, you know, maybe think through some new fundraising um, strategies that you can implement um, with that little bit of extra time on your hands. Um, something that's coming up that's really exciting is uh, Giving Tuesday Now. Um, if you haven't heard of it, Giving Tuesday rapidly um, created a um, Giving Tuesday Now website. So Giving Tuesday Now is happening May 5th and you can sign your organization up to participate. Um, you don't have to register, but if you wanted to, you can go to their website. They have tons of information about Giving Tuesday Now and how you can participate. Um, and that probably is gonna look like you setting up a crowdfunding or peer-to-peer -peer campaign and raising funds um, through May 5th. So that's a new opportunity that you can look into and see how um, you want to make that happen at your organization. So uh, something I wanted to really dive into is that um, now is probably not going to be a huge time for new donor acquisition um, unless you are um, kind of maybe more of those um, services that are like providing direct services um, to hospitals or the like, um, or, you know, needs in vulnerable communities. Um, so you may be able to get some new donors, but I think right now, um, the most important thing to focus on is donor retention. And so I would say your digital fundraising right now hinges on your donor retention because it's all about your existing relationships with your communities. So, um, when you're trying to fundraise, you want to go um, really go to those that are already in your network and um, who are, have already shown interest in supporting your organization because they probably want to see your organization um, flourish throughout this time too. So um, they're already invested and I think it's a great time to kind of follow up with those people, especially first time donors that you got this previous year end. So, um, you know, I would add to your to-do list to follow up with those first time donors, maybe enroll them in, into a specific email, um, email campaign to get a second donation from them. Um, and I think now is the best time to you know, take a little bit more time to invest in your relationships with donors. Maybe you can't do in-person lunches, but maybe um, you can do a lunch over Zoom and uh, have that one-on-one -on -one time with them. Um, I would also really recommend um, checking in with any existing major donors that have already pledged gifts um, and just make sure that those are still coming in. Um, and kind of check in with them um, to ensure that, you know, there's no disruptions on that end. Um, and if there are, then you can put that into your um, fundraising ask and, and um, have that count towards your fundraising goal um, if you do end up missing out on any of those larger gifts that you were expecting. Um, for donors that can't give right now, I think it's really important to be sensitive to that. Um, so I would say have an alternate ask, whether that's, um, you know, asking them just to share your campaign, or maybe it's asking them to be peer to peer fundraisers for you, um, so that they can still participate and show their support of your organization, even if they're not able to give at this time. Um, or you can always reposition your ask amount. So maybe for a uh, donors who typically give a little bit larger um, amounts, um, you know, have them uh, ask for a smaller amount if they can't do it. 
um, see what they think is approachable for them. And you might want to reposition what you can still accomplish with a smaller amount. So, um, so you can kind of still celebrate that donor and make their donation feel important, I think is really essential. Um, another great idea is to have people donate smaller amounts um, on a monthly recurring basis. So it's not such a big amount all at once, um, but still adds up at the end of the year. Um, and I would say just like during through throughout this time, the biggest thing that you want to do is have frequent communication and updates with all of your donors. So have maybe a weekly email that goes out and let them know what changes happened at your organization this week or um, tell a story about someone in your programs throughout um, the crisis. And so it's really super important that you have effective communication and, uh, you know, maybe host a webinar, let people know what's going on. Um, a lot of organizations that I see as well have um, a uh, COVID-19 response um, on the homepage of their website. So if you don't have something like that available, um, I would look into building out a landing page and then having that linked um, right on your website. So um, that's addressed the moment someone sees your homepage. Um, something that I've been uh, uh, suggesting a lot of uh, organizations do is try a virtual donor happy hour. Um, so uh, you've probably had a virtual happy hour at this point. I think most of us have. Um, but I think this is a great opportunity to get your donors together, um, especially in smaller groups, um, to mingle, uh, kind of ask how everyone is doing and, uh, you know, have that relational component of the happy hour as well. Um, but also it's a great time to give an update on the changes at your organization, let them know what's going on and what new things that you're having to deal with or what your personal challenges are. Um, and just making a soft ask. I think this is a good opportunity to just let them know like what some of the needs are and, you know, asking them to contribute if they can. Um, this is also a great opportunity to maybe do a happy hour monthly, have it scheduled already on the calendar ahead of time. So um, it's something that's a regular occurrence. And I think your donors are uh, really primed at this time to be interested in um, like events like this, just because, uh, you know, we're all home and we all are uh, interested in the causes that we already support. So I think it's a good time to kind of um, get their full attention. So without further ado, I want to dive into the 10 um, digital fundraising best practices um, that you can implement at your organization. Um, so the first thing um, is to rewrite your fundraising plan. So uh, probably at the beginning of this year, you sat down, um, had a list of all of your goals and all of your fundraising plans, and that has probably been disrupted. So now is a good time to take another step back, take a look um, at all of your fundraising initiatives right now and um, start rewriting that fundraising plan and adapting your strategy to be more digital fundraising focused. So um, I would probably, at least for the next two quarters, um, list out all of your existing fundraising activities, uh, list out your donor retention activities and your new fundraising activities and get that all in one concise, um, easy to implement plan. Um, and I think what's really important is to be flexible with this. Um, maybe you just want to plan out one quarter and um, kind of see how things progress and then you can plan out the second quarter, but um, you know, and be, uh, be flexible with your planning because um, I would recommend being more prepared than underprepared. Um, especially when it comes to like, if you can't do that big event in the fall, like have that planned out um, what your alternatives could be um, now so that you're not scrambling later. So we do have a resource to help you um, create your fundraising plan. So uh, we have this goal sheet that you can put in what your goals are for your donor retention and um, donor acquisition as well. And then just take a look at what some of those obstacles that are currently in your way. Maybe your um, donation form isn't, you can't edit it um, for 
uh, to be more relevant at this time. So maybe that's an obstacle that you need to overcome. Um, and just think through what are some of these obstacles in your way um, so that you can take a look now to, you know, help overcome them. Um, another thing is just, you know, for your fundraising plan it itself, you know, just mapping that um, your fundraising activities out for the next couple months um, and what you're hoping uh, you bring in versus what you, um, you actually need to, to bring in um, and having those plans laid out then and there. So uh, this resource is available for you to download those templates um, so that you can create your own um, fundraising plan um, and goal sheet. So we'll send out this link in the email that goes out after this uh, webinar, but you know, if you wanna navigate there now, feel free to do so and download your templates. Um, the second thing is just to act quickly. So um, digital fundraising and adapting that into your strategy is really, really urgent. So I think um, your next step is to start planning your digital fundraising now and getting those tools in place really, really quickly. You don't wanna wait um, because you could miss out on some some digital fundraising opportunities that way. Um, so, you know, better to be early and overly prepared and hopefully get buy-in from your board sooner rather than later. I think it's important to maybe get a board meeting um, if there isn't one already um, just scheduled for the next few weeks and just explain what some of these changes are at your organization and what any changes to your fundraising needs are and kind of, um, let them know how urgent it is that you have a fundraising solution in place to help you easily run your digital fundraising. So um, getting buy-in sooner rather than later, I think is really important. Um, so my third best practice is to make sure that your digital, your donation form on your website is optimized for conversion. Um, so now more than ever, your donation form um, is your donation form is more important now more than ever um, because you are probably going to see an increased amount of donations coming um, through your digital fundraising um, platforms and so that's you need a really really strong donation form to help um, make it easy for all your donors to give and help you get more donations. So 75% um, of young donors are turned off by an out-of-date website Donors are 38% more likely to give on a responsive website. Um, conversion rates increase 50% when form fields are lowered from four to three. And 65% of all fundraising web traffic is on mobile and is growing all the time. So when you're talking about your donation form, um, you really need a really good um, donation page right now more than ever. So uh, your donation form should be digital marketing focused, so it helps um, amplify the results of your digital marketing. So you want that email campaign to be really effective, um, but if your donation form isn't conversion optimized, you're going to end up like missing out on a lot of donations. So um, you'll want to make sure that your donation form is mobile optimized and maybe even supports mobile payments because a lot of people are going to be going to your site from their phone and donating on their devices. So if your form isn't mobile optimized, it's really important that um, you get that updated really quickly. And uh, ultimately having a short form um, and having just a delightful experience on your donation page is really important. Um, just to give them an experience that your donors will love. So um, most likely with a, a nicer form, you're going to see a lot more donations coming in um, and you'll get more donations with less effort that way. Um, so here's just a look at um, the donation form that we provide here at Causebox. Um, you can implement this right on your website. You can have a standalone page like this um, if you want to just have a donation page for a specific fundraising ask um, or um, you know have it embedded on on your website as either a pop-up for form or an on-page embedded form 
So uh, the next thing that you want to do is contextualize your appeal. So when you're thinking through launching a fundraising campaign right now, it's really, really important um, that you contextualize your ask um, because it's not business as usual right now. Um, so not acknowledging um, how the coronavirus pandemic um, applies to you uh, would just, you know, kind of be a little out of left field. So I think it's really important for you to, um, in your communications, acknowledge what's going on and how it's impacting your organization. Um, and then try your best to position how your cause is relevant at this time. Um, and another best practice is to answer why now in your ask. So why is it so important that your donors give now? Um, what about giving now helps, um, you know, you, you either prevent layoffs, for example, or, um, you know, whatever your, your needs are, why, why do you need this right now? And I think that's really important to answer in your appeal. Um, so a great example of this is the San Marino Schools Foundation. So unfortunately, um, some changes happened where their public uh, funding was decreased and they needed to really quickly raise funds in order to save 20 positions of teachers um, in their school district. So this is something that happened before all of this. So they needed to run this campaign anyway. But what they ended up doing is just acknowledging how um, the pandemic is affecting their campaign. So you can see um, they even position it in a way that they're saying like, you know, it's really, really important to save these 20 positions even more so now because so many people are going to be out of work. And so we want to continue to um, prevent unemployment. And so, uh, yeah, another thing to take a look at is how they also positioned that uh, the coronavirus is part of their community and is affecting their community. So um, that's something that you want to take a look at when you are crafting your appeals. All right, so when it comes to launching a fundraising campaign, the most important thing you want to do is to be really specific with your ask. So we highly recommend that you um, think through what your fundraising needs are and communicate them as clearly as possible. So we, help, we suggest you do this with um, the SMART fundraising uh, goals. So you want to set a goal that's really specific, um, very measurable, so easy to um, see success with, um, actionable, so something that um, you know, can easily be implemented, uh, realistic, so not asking for um, an amount maybe that you've never raised before, um, just something kind of within um, your grasp. And time bound, so uh, that is kind of the factor that helps you drive urgency for a campaign. Um, so when you're communicating what your goals are, the thing that you want to do is to be really honest and very specific about what your needs are at this time. So think about communicating who is benefiting from this campaign, um, how many people are benefiting, um, and then also taking a look at how exactly funds are being used and distributed, as well as communicating that impact um, along with your giving levels, your suggested giving levels for your campaign, which we call donation tiers. Um, so a great example of this is the Skid Row Housing Trust. They launched this campaign to support nearly 2,000 residents and uh, frontline staff in 26 buildings. And then they lay out really in a really detailed way what exactly the funds are going to. So supplemental food kits of oatmeal, lentils, cans of fruit, and water. So you know exactly how, when you give to this organization as a donor, you know exactly how these funds are being used and distributed. So I think this is a great example um, for you to just get really specific with how, what exactly you're doing when it comes to funds and what the impact of uh, your donors can be. And they can celebrate in participating in impacting 2,000 residents. Um, so 68% of donors agree that knowing how their donation makes an impact is really important to their gift. 
And so something that you can do is also tie your campaign suggested giving levels to that impact. So this is on Skid Row Housing Trust Campaign. They've done a really good job at having these different giving levels and having them um, showcase really how donors funds can be used. So $75 provides 75 thermometers. So think through how that can work for your organization as well. All right, so something that you want to do uh, is to try peer-to-peer -peer fundraising. So uh, with organizations that use peer-to-peer, -peer, they tend to raise about twice as much as opposed to crowdfunding campaigns. So that's something that we've seen over the years Every time there's so many donations that come in through peer-to-peer -peer fundraising campaigns. Um, and now is a really, really good time to launch peer-to-peer, -peer, especially if you've never tried this before. Um, because peer-to-peer -peer is fundamentally about relationships. And so with people leveraging their own communities for peer-to-peer -peer fundraising, um, you'll be able to see some new donors coming in um, maybe for the first time. So you'll be getting to actually acquire some new donors through peer-to-peer -peer fundraising because it is leveraging relationships. Um, another advantage of peer-to-peer -peer is that it's an alternate ask. So if uh, someone is in the position where they can't give the gift that they usually give this year, this is a great ask for them um, because they can promote that to their communities and still have a way to impact uh, your organization. So uh, also peer-to-peer, -peer, ideal for digital fundraising. So um, tons and tons of peer-to-peer -peer campaigns are really made for online giving and flourish with digital. So um, if you've never done peer-to-peer -peer before, a good way to start is to simply start with some of your board members and maybe some top volunteers at your organization. Um, they're great people to um, tap to just get peer-to-peer -peer up and going for the first time. As a best practice to help you get the most out of your peer-to-peer -peer fundraising, I really recommend creating a toolkit with some either pre-written uh, social media posts, pre-written emails, or um, even like a sample communications calendar to help your fundraisers best promote their page and leverage um, fundraising in their communities. So Summit Assistance Dogs is doing this really, really well um, with their virtual fundraiser. Um, and their virtual tables and they're really equipping their community to reach out and um, and share across social media share over email to, to contribute to their virtual tables at um, for their virtual event all right tip number seven i would encourage you to try getting a match so donors give about 50 percent more when a match is in place um, so what you want to try and do is obtain a matching gift to help drive donations and urgency for any upcoming campaigns that you're going to be running. Um, a great place to start with getting a match is to ask the board to contribute. Um, another good way to um, just get a match in place is to follow up with a major donor who maybe gives every year and um, you're expecting a gift from. See if you can reposition their pledged gift as a match or any existing pledged gifts as a match as well. Um, and the other opportunity is to just engage a partner in, um, in participating in a match as well. Um, so Skid Row Housing Trust, they, uh, with their campaign that they recently launched, they got their partner Banner and Bank to agree to match funds. And so you can see that's really driving a lot of urgency for their campaign um, because they're on that time limit. So they have to raise those funds by Wednesday, April 15th in order to maximize the matching gift. So drives urgency, it drives up donations. It's a really, really important thing um, that you'll wanna consider when it comes to your digital fundraising strategy at this time. All right. Um, as Skid Row Housing Trust um, has done, now is a really good time to activate partners to participate in fundraising. Um, I think a lot of companies are in the middle of trying to figure out ways that they can give back at this time too. 
Um, even if they're hurting, I think right now is an important time where um, people can really make an impact. And so I think tapping those existing partners that you have right now um, is really important um, to help you drive up your digital fundraising. So if you can get them to commit to a match, that's great. But if you can't, um, maybe try and ask them if they want to participate in a peer to peer fundraising campaign where maybe their staff sets up their own pages and then they um, can fundraise on your behalf. Um, another idea is to just get them to crowdfund for you, spin up a quick page, provide them um, a page that's you know, tailored for their company, maybe has their logo on it as well, um, and just give them the tools they need to crowdfund for you. Um, and you know, if they're crowdfunding for you, hopefully they're promoting your campaign through their channels. Um, but even if they don't have their own campaign, uh, share with them the existing campaign that you have and see what they can do to promote that on social media or to their email list or just even to their staff would be great too. Um, so just see which ways um, your partner can participate in fundraising. Um, a great example of this is North Texas Food Bank. They've probably done, um, I want to say over 130 partner campaigns. And uh, right now is no different. They got Mid-America Mortgage on board to do a crowdfunding campaign where um, they're helping raise funds to build 60,000 boxes of um, you know, food to uh, meet the increased need at this time. All right, so uh, last, but actually not last, but second to last, uh, monthly giving. So when you're talking about um, getting your donors to give right now, um, there's a few things that can help you establish a really good foundation for digital fundraising, and that's monthly giving. Um, monthly recurring donors tend to give about 42% more annually than one-time donors and 90% of recurring donors tend to stay. So they have uh, twice the uh, retention rate as just one-time donors. So if you can get a recurring donor, they're probably gonna stick around for a long time. And recurring giving grew 17% just last year. So this is a trend at the moment um, that I think is still applicable right now because it betrays uh, just the insight into your donors is that they want to support you on an ongoing basis um, and kind of participate and partner with your organization when it comes to creating impact. So uh, for you, I think it really makes a lot of sense right now to help you uh, that you stand up recurring giving so that you can sustainably fundraise and have an idea of what you can expect coming in throughout the year. This is also great for covering operational expenses. Um, so if you need to cover rent every month, recurring giving can probably help with that. Um, so make sure when you're looking at recurring giving that um, it's at least available on your donation form so that donors can opt in to do recurring and support you um, on an ongoing basis. Another thing to think about is to consider doing a recurring giving campaign where you're asking your existing donors to make a recurring donation right now so that you can quickly build up um, those that list of those recurring donors and have the main ask be defaulted to recurring so you're specifically driving recurring gifts in a short period of time. Um, so here's just a look at how that could look for your donation form with monthly giving um, pre-selected for them. And this is an example of a campaign that has been running for a while now where they got um, a bunch of recurring gifts in a short period of time. And now this is just kind of going every month. Um, they're expecting these donations to come in. And, you know, about having that 90% retention rate really helps you um, plan for what you're, um, uh, to cover your ongoing fundraising needs. And lastly, uh, my number 10 uh, best practice tip is to really quickly ramp up your digital fundraising tools. So uh, to help you roll all of this out, you need a digital fundraising platform that helps you 
um, get your digital fundraising up and running very quickly um, and also takes the stress out of fundraising. So you don't want to sign on to a complicated software right now um, where your uh, team is all stressed out. They're trying to learn something that's difficult. Um, so you'll want to have something that's really uncomplicated and easy to work with for your team. Something that also helps just streamline all of your digital fundraising is to keep all of your digital fundraising initiatives under one roof. So you're not um, having a peer to peer campaign in one place and then a donation page in another place and then having to figure out how to reconcile everything later. Um, make it easy for yourself and keep all of your digital fundraising in one place. Um, you're, you'll also want to ensure that your digital fundraising platform helps streamline your reporting and administrative tasks. So um, collects all that donor data for you, automatically sends receipts, has some integrations in place if you are currently using um, a CRM or donor management system or email newsletter service. Um, so you'll want to find something that really helps you streamline reporting and, ad and your admin tasks so it helps you save some time. Um, and you'll also want to make sure that your, your donation form is digital, digital marketing focused so that you're able to convert more donors. And uh, when you are looking at a digital fundraising platform, you'll want to get the support that you need to stand up digital. So um, some platforms are pretty hands off where you kind of just try and figure out everything yourself. But if you're if this is your first effort to really make a big transition to digital fundraising, having someone to support you throughout the whole process is really, really important. Um, so uh, Causebox helps you do this really easily. So um, you can get your fundraising, uh, your digital fundraising launched for free right now under our basic plan. So if you're interested in that, please uh, check out our website and you can sign up for free, we waive transaction fees. Um, there's no limit at the moment, so you can do unlimited digital fundraising for free on Causebox. Um, and yeah, we I encourage you to check us out if you're interested in learning more about how you can build out and run your digital fundraising on our platform. So if you want to see what this looks like in practice, we do have a webinar coming up on the 15th at 4 p.m. Eastern that goes through some of the best practices for digital fundraising, a lot of digital fundraising examples, and uh, talks through on how uh, Cosvax can help you do this with, in less time so that you get more results compared to your current digital fundraising software. So um, you can go ahead and register today and join us then. Um, so I, uh, yeah, I'd love to hear from you guys. Um, I know a few questions came in throughout the conversation. So um, I will be, uh, also just to answer a couple of them, I will be sharing the PowerPoint. So I'll send out an email um, to, on Monday with the PowerPoint slides so that you can review this on your own. And I'll also be sending out the recording. So you'll get that shortly. So. Um, yeah, any questions that you have, feel free to send them my way and I'll get to as many as possible in the next few minutes. All right, so there's a bunch of questions coming in. I'm trying to read them all. So, um, so one of the questions I saw was about like peer-to-peer -peer fundraising um, and Facebook. So of course you can run your peer-to-peer -peer fundraising on Facebook. Um, that's in place. Um, one of the things that I think is better um, as an organization, and many of the organizations that I work with have. Um, 
have said this as well, is that with Facebook, you don't get a lot of data from your peer to peer fundraisers. So you don't really know who gave to your organization, which makes it really hard to retain them in the long run. Um, I also think it's just really fragmented. Um, so uh, when you have a uh, platform that supports peer to peer fundraising, you can direct everyone to fundraise through your platform. So you get all of that data um, really easily in one place. So you're not having to jump back and forth to different, um, to different platforms. So um, someone asked what happens after the free offer for the digital fundraising platform. So yeah, if you get set up on our basic plan um, right now, we have um, uncapped donations. Typically the basic plan is capped at a hundred donations. Um, so it's always free. Uh, you know, you can, there's no monthly fees, no transaction fees. Um, and uh, for the next several months, we're going to be, uncapping those donations. So you won't have to worry about paying anything um, over the next few months. Um, when this period ends, we haven't put like a time limit on it right now, but um, uh, later on you could consider upgrading to the light plan, which starts at 85 if you go to month to month or if you go annual, it's 660 for the year, which hourly is down to $55 a month. Um, someone asked what platform I would suggest for a virtual donor happy hour. Um, so we use Zoom. Um, it's worked really well for us um, when we do webinars and we do our meetings. And I think a lot of organizations so far that I've talked to have used um, Zoom or GoToMeeting um, for their virtual happy hours. So Aaron said that we have a we have a digital fundraising campaign in place right now um, that uh, for collegiate athletics um, and finding that their donations are a bit slow at the moment um, due to the outbreak. So what are my recommendations to increase contributions during this time outside of current donors? Um, so outside of current donors, I think it is really important to, you know, do your best to follow up with current donors. Um, and for any current donors, maybe have some kind of webinar um, to get them updated on what anything that um, has been impacting your organization due to the outbreak. Um, but if you're looking to get new donors, I would highly suggest trying peer to peer fundraising because that's probably where most of your new donors could come in during this time. Um, so uh, it sounds like you're working with a lot of teams, like with the collegiate athletics. So I would try your best to engage some of the uh, teams to do peer to peer fundraising within their communities. So Cheryl ask, um, asked, uh, we have an older donor base, any data on their use of peer to peer or any suggestions on how to make it more appealing? Most have a dislike or distrust of Facebook. Um, yeah, uh, so I would say, um, I think it takes a few leaders in your community to buy into peer to peer fundraising and make everyone feel a little bit more comfortable. Um, so for you, I would highly suggest getting a few of maybe your older board members to set up their pages first um, and have them there as an example. 
Um, Causebox makes it super, super easy for um, anyone to sign up to fundraise. Um, a lot of people don't really have many um, issues setting up their page, um, but maybe if they do, you could set up pages for people um, that are having any trouble and then provide their pages to them um, so that they can go ahead and fundraise. But I think whenever possible, having people set up their own pages is great. But um, yeah, definitely having a few older members of your community buy in first, um, I think helps and it makes them feel like they can do it too. Um, and I would also um, make sure that your campaign is really branded. Um, I think part of the distrust of Facebook um, is that it's not branded for your organization. So it's like a little bit like, does this donate button actually go to your organization? Um, so I think that's some of the hesitancy there. Um, but if you set up a branded campaign with your logo and your colors and um, maybe even brand the URL for the campaign so it's um, you know under your own URL, um, like a subdomain, uh, that can help encourage uh, more trust um, from your community. Yeah, so unfortunately, it looks like our time has come to an end today. There's been so many great questions coming in. Um, so I am going to save as many of these as possible and try and get back to you. If um, any of you want, um, you can email me at Candice at causevox.com or support at causevox.com if that's easier and uh, or re reply to my email that goes out on Monday and I'd be happy to um, talk a little bit more with you either through email or set up a digital fundraising consultation to chat more in depth about your digital fundraising needs. So um, I'll include all of this in the email that goes out and thank you everyone for um, joining today. I really appreciate you taking the time to listen and learn more about digital fundraising. All right, take care and stay safe everybody and have a great weekend.